Welcome to Hot Chips 24. Keynote 3. The cloud transforms IT. Big data transforms business. There's a, I'm really happy to be able to uh, announce that uh, Pat Gelsinger from uh, EMC uh, will be giving this uh, talk on uh, cloud and big data. Um, I think uh, Pat has touched all of our lives here, and I think you, many of the audience probably uh, know him, but let me just run down some of the, the salient points in his bio. Uh, Pat holds a bachelor's uh, a BS degree from Santa Clara, and a master's degree from Stanford University. Um, his term at uh, Intel started a long time ago, and his uh, primary achievements in his tenure at Intel were, uh, he was the architect of the 486 uh, microprocessor. Uh, he then became the general manager of the team that uh, followed up with Pentium and Pentium Pro. Uh, and he was also actually Intel's first uh, chief technology officer. Um, and in, in, in that role, he did something very nice for me and a whole bunch of people, uh, I think, that are in the audience. He created a thing called uh, the Technical Career Path, uh, which allowed uh, some of us more geeky-oriented people to have a career without having to manage hundreds or thousands of people. And for that, I'm actually personally quite grateful. Um, uh, Pat went on to become the general manager of the Digital Enterprise Group uh, that uh, delivered uh, Xeon uh, and also gave rise uh, to the Nehalem uh, microprocessor family. Um, in 2009, Pat joined uh, EMC in his current capacity as president and COO of the information infrastructure product. Um, and uh, coming up shortly in, I think, uh, a, a few days, uh, Pat is going to take over as the CEO for VMware. So we have a truly accomplished person here uh, for this keynote. I'd like to warmly welcome Pat, please. Thank you very much, uh, Rumi. Uh, and uh, since Rumi was kind to me, I'll be kind to him and won't say any bad things about him. So. <laughs> okay, he's off. Okay, good. He won't hear me. Um, but uh, it is a pleasure to be here, and I guess I sort of feel like, uh, you know, it's like when you uh, make the vacation home to see your parents, you're sort of going back home, and this feels like coming back home and to uh, where I started. And, you know, as many of you know, I uh, spent, uh, you know, essentially 30 years in the uh, microprocessor industry in some capacity or another. And, uh, you know, I still uh, remember when I was, uh, you know, making the decision to leave Intel and uh, go to uh, EMC, and uh, I was about to go on a half sabbatical, uh, and uh, so I had a four-week vacation. I wanted to, you know, clear my mind before making this uh, decision. So I had the Intel offer to stay in hand, and I had the EMC offer to go in hand. And you know, my wife and I were going on a vacation. And one of the last meetings I was in before I left, I'm sitting in the meeting and I'm looking at Justin Ratner. Right, and uh, well, Justin was going to come to my son's wedding, right? You know, and just you know, and then I looked at Steve Pulowski, right? And Steve was there at my daughter's graduation, and all of these kind of things, and just you know, tears started to come to my eyes at the time, and it's just like you know, I didn't know where I quite ended, and uh, you know, Intel began, so it was really hard to make that uh, transition, right, out of Intel and out of the uh, microprocessor industry after having been part of it for uh, nearly 30 years. So this sort of feels like I'm coming back to where I was born. Right in many ways, so it is a, a true pleasure and honor to uh, be with you uh, today. And I guess uh, I'm either testament that there is life after the uh, chip industry. Right, some of you may not be clear that that's the case. 
right? There really is, right? Yeah, <laughs> testament of that. And uh, also that for some of us that were mediocre designers, you can actually be successful in your career as well. So, right, it is, uh, you know, a great opportunity. And, you know, clearly, uh, you know, three years at EMC, you know, stepping into systems and storage has been a, a radical uh, shift, an East Coast, uh, you know, storage-centric uh, 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 company. And uh, now uh, coming back to the West Coast, so, right, when my wife and I made the decision to join join EMC. We bought a home in uh, Boston, and uh, literally the day that uh, Joe Tucci, the CEO, Paul Moritz, and I de start, decided to start this process of making the leadership change at VMware was the very day that uh, we finished remodeling our Boston house. Yeah. And of course, my wife simply responded, so you're killing my project, right? <laughs> So if anybody's in the market for a nice house in Boston, I got a really, really good deal for you, right? So it went on the market uh, Monday, so uh, the truck arrives here in Palo Alto on Friday, and we're moving, you know, back to town. So uh, look forward to that. And, uh, you know, in just a few minutes, uh, roaming around uh, beforehand, uh, many uh, familiar faces, right, from the industry. So, right, just great to see, you know, many again, and uh, obviously being back in the area more here uh, starting uh, literally next week. Look forward to catching up uh, with uh, many of you. So, you know, with that and a little bit of background, we'll dive into the topic and, you know, something a little bit different than a hardcore microprocessor talk, which I'm no longer competent to do. Some of you might assert I never was competent to do that, Fred, but uh, anyway, sorry. My, my dear friend Fred Weber here in the front row, so I might pick on Fred, right? We've been picking on each other for many years, so right, we'll quite enjoy that. But the title of the talk is Cloud Transforms IT, uh, Big Data Transforms Business, right? Some of the things that we've been driving very much with respect to the drive to cloud uh, computing and what that means from our perspective, and then talking a bit about uh, security and big data a little bit more. So some of the big topics that we're driving and along the way, we'll try to make it somewhat relevant to uh, the chip and uh, silicon uh, industry. And then we'll have time for some Q's and A's at the end. So you know, as we think about the waves of uh, change of IT, right, you know, we've just seen these continuous waves come across the uh, industry, right, from mainframe to mini to PC to, right, to uh, internet, and finally into this generation of uh, cloud computing. Each one of those waves has been right, disruptive to the existing industry. It's also ushered in a set of new and uh, significant technologies and also uh, companies as part of it. Uh, being part of EMC for the last uh, three years, right? Headquarters of EMC sits right in that uh, 128 corridor uh, in the Boston area. We get to look out over the carnage uh, of the uh, uh, industry of the mini computer industry. You know, EMC bought the remains of Data General, right? So we have some of those buildings. We get to look out over deck and all of that kind of stuff. So we know how right dramatic and disruptive these waves of change can be. And basically, the winners. Right, learn how to ride those waves, and the losers end up being uh, consumed in the process of those waves of technology change. And unquestionably, we are in a very radical period of change again in the IT industry. And I like to think about the data center having gotten fairly boring right, as we uh, finished the last decade, and it's gotten very exciting right, as we began this decade, and we expect it to be very exciting for a number of years to come. So what is that clearly cloud? Right, and cloud transforms IT, right, a fundamentally new way of building right, infrastructure, of operating uh, infrastructure, as well as consuming right, uh, infrastructure. So it is uh, quite a radical change in that process. And if we think about IT, right, IT today has become very verticalized, right, and we call this reactive IT, right? I need to put up a new database, so I need to get a new hunk of infrastructure, I need to have a new set of DBAs, right, associated with it, right? And basically, you don't have a cost accounting model, it ends up being a flat tax that's put back on all of the uh, business units. We'll call that reactive uh, IT. Right, as we move to this cloud generation of IT, we'll call that proactive IT. In which case, right, you know, there's a service catalog driven and increasingly a self-service model of IT where basically you can go to the service catalog, you can basically ask for so many VMs, so many different application uh, instances and have them you know, put up uh, very uh, quickly and rapidly. 
Right, and right as we move through this phase of proactive IT, right, we want to drive to an era of what we'll call innovative IT, in which case, right, you freed up a lot of those operational burdens and allowing a larger and larger portion of the IT budget to be poured into innovation. And as you think about that, right, most, you know, I've yet to talk to a CIO who says, I'm going to spend more money on IT next year. Right, and particularly in the economic environment that we're in today, you know, the IT budget is fixed. Maybe on average about 4% right, of companies' uh, revenues they spend on IT. No companies are increasing their IT budget going forward, but what they are demanding is how can I get more out of the budget that I am spending. Right? And today about 70% of the IT budget is consumed in, key, in terms of keeping things running. Right? And if 70 plus percent is keeping the lights on, that means that 20 plus percent is available for innovation. And everybody says, how can I whack the 70% so I can spend more than 20% on innovative uh, new opportunities that they go through? And this is very much what we see as the opportunity of cloud computing, right, is drive very rapidly through the steps of uh, transformation. And with that, it's a cloud infrastructure, a new cloud operating model, and then finally, cloud-based uh, applications become right, the uh, opportunity for the future. And in this, we see that they're changing all levels of IT. We're seeing the infrastructure layer right, moving instead of silos of infrastructure to you know, uh, pools of infrastructure that are increasingly automated. Right, a new applications layer emerging built around frameworks that you know, assumes a scalable right, uh, infrastructure underneath it. Right, and finally, right, a new set of devices that are emerging as we move into the post-PC uh, era. Right, and all of these are driving right, innovation right, and disruption at every level of the uh, stack of IT. So it's a wonderfully disruptive time, and what was getting to be sort of boring has gotten to be very exciting and transformative. So, you know, as a, being a technologist, I always sort of like to look under the covers and say, well, what really are the technology trends that are causing this rise of cloud computing? There has to be something that's enabling uh, this to occur. And, uh, you know, we see three fundamental technology things that are happening, and we'll look at each one of these a little bit uh, more uh, closely. You know, one of these being the uh, rise of flash technology, solid state, closing the I.O. gap. Uh, the second one being uh, the uh, rise of multi-core x86, making standardized high performance uh, very uh, uh, available for infrastructure. And then the final one being virtualization or a fundamental abstraction laying emerging for right, uh, data center uh, resources. And let's just go through each one of those a little bit. And you know, what's happened in uh, storage is basically we got to the 15K RPM drive, and you can't make the physical media go any faster. So the performance of storage basically has flatlined for the most of the last uh, decade, while the performance of uh, processors has continued right, nominally tracking uh, Moore's law. And this has opened up right, an extraordinary I.O. gap right, that essentially has you know, opened up a 100x gap right, over the last uh, decade in the relative performance of processing uh, versus uh, I.O. And we'll just call that the I.O. gap. Right, and because of that, right, you know, we've seen right, you know, all sorts of crazy things happen in the uh, infrastructure to accommodate that, but fundamentally there's a big gap between uh, those uh, two worlds. And what happens into that place? That's where flash technology is stepping in. And solid state storage, while the fundamental characteristics of solid state storage right, are extraordinary in terms of performance, you know, maybe 1,000x the performance capability that you'd get off of a hard drive in terms of IOs per second, right, the cost is maybe 50x. So clearly, you're not just going to go replace all of your hard drives right, with uh, 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 solid state medium right, at 50x cost per bit. You can't possibly do that. But now you're going to insert right, a caching medium or a flash storage medium as another tier in the hierarchy. And that's what we're seeing emerging very rapidly. You know, as we say, a little bit of flash goes a long way. And so we're seeing a flash tier emerge inside of storage arrays. We're seeing special purpose flash devices emerge right in the storage hierarchy. We're also seeing flash on the server side, either in appliances or directly, right, as uh, PCIe-based cards or other uh, form factors directly into uh, the servers as well to fill that uh, I.O. performance and we expect this to continue as we go forward right over the next several years as we mature right the role of flash in the IO stack uh, in the next few years.
So that's Flash, and we could talk about that for several hours, right? And obviously, EMC, we have lots of products in that space. There are a few other companies like Fusion IO, et cetera, who stepped into that. Obviously, being the EMC right, uh, president for about two more days, of course, we have the best strategy in that space. Um, that was a joke, right? Yeah. Wake up out there, right? I know it's after lunch, but we have to stay awake. Um, but, you know, we have lots of good things that we're doing, but the industry overall is doing a lot of innovation in that space. Uh, second one is, right, we need fuel for, you know, we, we need these powerful engines, and clearly we see no uh, abatement in the Intel processor roadmap uh, going uh, forward. Uh, EMC is 100% committed, right, to that. And again, we'll talk on the other side of the wire, right, what happens in handsets and mobility, right, but in the server space, right, you know, we believe that fundamentally it's a multi-core x86 world, right, and everything is moving from, right, hardware innovations to software riding on top of that x86 multi-core uh, environment, and we see no end to that in sight for years uh, to come. And, you know, with that, uh, and this is a, uh, you know, a compute view, uh, where, right, uh, uh, obviously in terms of uh, volume, right, it's an x86 world, but now when you look at it in terms of revenue, right, it's becoming an x86 uh, world as well. And uh, so, you know, I think the number this year is now something in the order of 72, 73% of all data center compute spend goes into x86, I mean the 11, the 2011 uh, number. So that means the sum of all other architectures, Z, X, P, ARM, everything else, right, uh, add them up, right, is uh, less than 30%, and no single architecture represents more than 10%, right? So, you know, it's just very quickly saying, you know, this is the only architecture uh, that matters in the data center, and thus, right, you know, we are betting, right, our strategy, both EMC and VMware, heavily on this being the compute engine uh, for the future in the data center uh, space. Now, um, you know, as a, as a result of being an old processor guy, you know, we pulled a little bit of data together, right? And the nexus of innovation, though, when we look into what's happening in the microprocessor space, obviously it used to be the desktop. That's what we used to spend all of our time designing for, right? And this is the revenue being spent, right, in terms of chipset, CPUs, revenues, right, for uh, 2001. And this is what it looked like in 2005. So, you know, obviously the rise of mobile and we see server happening. So, you know, that's sort of logical. And then uh, look what happens in 2011, right? Basically the desktop has become increasingly irrelevant. You see the push to mobile. You continue to see the rise in a server. And uh, this is a little bit of projection, right? You know, pulling data together from IDC and a little bit of uh, Rich Bruner and my interpolation of the future as well, since no, right, you know, we couldn't get an analyst view precisely, right, uh, of it. But our estimation is it just all moves to the edge, right, as you go forward. And, you know, with the rise of uh, cloud computing, right, basically computing activities are either associated with what happens in the data center right, in those clouds that we're building, private or public or hybrid clouds, or all of it's moving to uh, mobile devices uh, as we uh, go forward into the future. And it's quite a dramatic and massive shift in, uh, you know, in about a decade where you see this enormous uh, shift from computing being in the center to computing being uh, at the edges. And we expect this trend to be unabated uh, over the uh, next uh, five to 10 years, right, where right, all computing ends up in the data center right, as this cloud environment, or being shoved into the smallest, most power efficient uh, mobile device, mobile connected device uh, possible. And pretty much nothing in the middle matters at all. You know, furthermore, we expect that that computing in the uh, data center space, you know, means all computing, right? All forms of servers, all forms of storage, uh, all forms of networking, right, moves to some form of standardized uh, x86 infrastructure uh, components, right, with a layer of software on top of those, and we'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. You know, and a few of our thoughts on uh, uh, silicon, and uh, again, being an old silicon guy, uh, it's, uh, I can stand on stage and, you know, sort of pontificate about what you should do, right, uh, in that regard, and, uh, right, and not have a whole lot of culpability uh, for it, so, but that's, well, that's being part of a keynote presenter, right? right. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, from, this, from the silicon side on the mobile, and then we'll look at the server side for a second, 
you know, we do see everything moving to a multi-device world where, right, you know, the nexus of innovation has moved away from the PC or any other single device, and now all application development is being aimed for a cloud delivery model to be delivered on multiple devices. Right, so, and there's no, you know, every application says, you know, I don't know if Android or iOS or, you know, Microsoft phone or who, you know, who knows what that delivery vehicle will be. So I have to assume it's a multi-device social mobile world, right, for which it's being uh, delivered. And thus, right, you know, what do we need to do in silicon? Obviously, the integration, you know, continuing improvements in performance, uh, power curves, of course. But embedding of virtualization technologies we see as critical, maybe because I'm part of VMware, virtual machineware, right? You know, maybe that's a little bit of a bias statement, right, uh, coming forward. But we just see all these devices need to be virtualized. They're going to need multiple personalities, multiple application, right, capabilities as part of it. Graphics, obviously, it's all remoting uh, protocols, right, uh, coming from some form of presentation uh, layer. We see security as we do more and more security functions on these devices becoming increasingly critical, uh, informing, embedding of uh, not just uh, access or authentication security, but also encryption technology as part of it. And these have to be done in the way, I'll say, as some standardized view of how the operating system or the virtual machine layers as appropriate, right, can take advantage of those. So those would be some of the things that we would say get to be increasingly critical for what the uh, mobile silicon requirements are for the future. And from the server side, right, we see, and I'll talk more about our definition for the software-defined data center in a moment, but, you know, it's, it's about this common scale-out x86 infrastructure for which all of these services are running in the data center. So things like deeper and deeper integration of uh, networking technology we think becomes standard part of how we develop microprocessors and uh, server uh, platforms in the future. We need more and more right, ability to you know, deliver these presentation layers to right, uh, remote uh, mobile uh, devices. So you know, acceleration of remoting and graphics protocols, right, the key functions coming into uh, hardware, right, support for virtualization uh, capabilities, and of course, Caching, 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 right? You know, there's no end to the kind of things that we have in mind for what, you know, happens in terms of I.O. functionality, right, and size of workloads when we get into the big data discussion a little bit later, right? Our appetites for uh, memory are unabated uh, as we go into the uh, future. So, you know, those would be some of the key things that we would look for, right? And obviously, this is all sitting across the common virtualized uh, fabric, you know, that we call the software-defined data center. So you know, that's a bit of the view of the uh, microprocessor uh, requ and silicon requirements. Uh, uh, so we've talked about flash, we've talked about processing, right, and then virtualization. And the magic thing happened, right, in uh, 2009 or so, where we now have more workloads that run virtual than run physical. So we've now you know, gone to the point where there's more operating system instances that think they're running on hardware and aren't than there are those that really are. So we now have, you know, tipped over and, you know, as the forecast to show, right, you know, that we expect, you know, on the order of, you know, 5 to 10 percent increase in that per year. Uh, this week we're holding the uh, VMworld uh, conference, which I spoke at uh, on Monday to uh, 20,000 of the, uh, you know, virtual machine uh, faithful uh, up there. And, you know, we just see no abatement in that trend to moving to a common virtualized environment, right, as the delivery uh, platform for all application and OS uh, instances as we uh, go forward uh, into the future. And, you know, the power of the virtual machine has been uh, very significant, right? You know, if I used to want to provision a piece of hardware in a non-virtualized way, it used to take weeks. And if I put in place a big procurement department and a, uh, you know, a purchasing uh, cycle associated with it, it might be quarters. And literally now, right, a few clicks Right, and I can have a VM instance that's established uh, very uh, uh, quickly. 
Uh, and all right, you know, if we think about that, though, right, you know, even though the VM instant might only take you know, a minute to form, right, and I think you know, our record now is we can spin up VMs right off of a single host. We can do you know, on the order of 50 VMs a minute now that we can establish, and we keep you know, each release making that better and better. Right, you know, pretty phenomenal, right? What exactly do you want with you know hundreds of VMs running on a single CPU? But anyway, uh, you, you know, and as we continue to drive that, but unfortunately, right, each of those VM instances comes with another set of services. I need firewall services, identity services, VPN services, all those other types of things as well, and those are not nearly as virtual or instantaneous as the underlying uh, hardware, right? Uh, I mean, the underlying VM mechanisms would be enabled. So. You know, what are we trying to do? Turn all of those other functions of the data center into that same virtual set of services that can be right, established for what we'll call a virtual data center in that same minutes or seconds of operation as we go forward. And that's what we think of as the software-defined data center, where literally all of these services right, are made available as services, right, virtualized, and the control of this data center is all being delivered through a layer of software automation. So I'm able to literally have a few clicks, create a VM instance, have policies dictating all of the other services that would, that application instance would require operating inside of that VM, bring up all of the right networking connections, all of the right, right uh, security services associated with it, spawn the creation of the right uh, storage uh, mechanisms, and be able to deliver that virtual data center right, in an instantaneous way. So that's the world that we're working for, and we call that the software-defined data center. Now, if we go into a data center today and we look at that data center, what we see is a museum of IT past. Right? And over in this corner of the museum, right, we'll see the mainframe corner of the museum. And we go over to this set, we'll see the database portion of the museum. When we go to this portion, right, we'll see the Windows Server portion. Right? We see all these different portions of IT past. And fundamentally, you know, what causes the 70 plus percent of costs of the data center to be consumed right, in the operations of keeping it on right, is all of these independent silos. Right? And in fact, we keep creating those silos, right? Today, we're creating new physical silos that are totally distinct and separate from the other silos. And we call some of those things like Hadoop today, right? And we'll also have things like the HPC silo as well. But our view of the future is, is that all of those need to be delivered on a common pool of shared infrastructure, right, that allows you to abstract totally from the underlying physical infrastructure to pool the physical infrastructure into a set of shareable resources, and then to automate right, that. And it's truly in that pool and automate that gives you the efficiencies of scale that are uniquely enabled by a common abstraction layer across it. And that's what we think of when we say the software-defined data center, right? It's being able to look across all of that infrastructure and deliver a, a set of services that policies allow individual application instances to operate and be delivered for any of those. So that's a brief view of software-defined data center and our expectations for what we're driving to as we work to have this common software layer across all data center uh, instances. Now, as we move down this uh, transition to the cloud, one of the issues that emerges more and more powerfully right, uh, is uh, security and uh, trust. And the challenges of delivering trust in this environment become far more profound as we uh, look to the future. And if you look at our current world of security model, right, in fact, what we see is one that is almost entirely bound to physical infrastructure. You know, we take the wire and we snap the wire and put the VPN at the right place coming in, right? Or we establish the firewall at the physical boundary, right, of certain instances of physical infrastructure, right? And it's essentially bolted on and associated with these physical uh, boundaries. But as we look to the world of the cloud, right, you know, basically none of those physical infrastructures are any longer suitable for the world that we're in. 
Uh, I recently was on a panel, uh, a Bloomberg panel, right? And it was, a very, it was a very interesting panel because I had the CTO and founder of Zynga, and I had the head of cloud infrastructure for IBM, right? And, and myself, so the three of us were on the panel. And uh, the question of cloud security came up, and the IBM person in good IBM fashion, anybody here from IBM? Anybody here? Okay, so I might offend you. What's your name? Ron. Hi, Ron. Sorry, and sorry in advance. Okay, right. So I'll just. Um, and uh, the IBM woman who runs cloud, right? Then when the question of security for the cloud came up, you know, she basically said, "Hey, you know, IBM has built all of its products for security. We have more security expertise than anybody has in the world, right? And if our products and you build your cloud on our products, we got it covered." A nice IBM answer, don't you agree? I responded saying, in a world where IT was built where they controlled the devices, they controlled the applications, and they controlled the infrastructure, that was an appropriate answer. But as we move to the world of the cloud, right, it's now BYOD, you no longer control the device. It's now a world of SaaS where you no longer control the applications, and it's now a world of cloud infrastructure where you no longer control the infrastructure. So exactly what portion of the old security model is appropriate to that new security challenge when you control neither the app, neither the infrastructure, nor the devices any longer? It's an entirely new world that demands entirely new mechanisms for security. Right? And with that, right, you know, we, we've laid out a fairly bold agenda for what a virtualized mechanisms for security right, need to be done that follow these uh, three premises. Right, one is, is that you know, we need to reassociate right, all, of the ver all of the security mechanisms from the physical domain into the logical domain. We have to put those security things onto these new logical boundaries that represent the application boundaries. And when we choose to vMotion or move things around, all the security mechanisms go with it. You know, firewalls, VPN, access methods, et cetera. So they need to be you know, dynamic and built-in defenses. Right? You know, and those defenses need to then become increasingly analytic right, and risk-based. Right, because the kind of broad denial of services attacks that we might used to be worried about no longer are even interesting. Right? You know, those are dealt with. It's now these deep and slow APT type attacks right, that are highly statistical right, uh, in nature. So we have to have risk-based. And you, know, you coming in from uh, San Jose right, into the infrastructure in, right, in uh, Palo Alto, no big deal. Right? When your identity is coming in from Bulgaria right, and accessing services that you don't typically access, that's a high-risk event. Right? And you know, for that, your credentials looked exactly the same, right? but your behavior was dramatically different. And those are the kind of security mechanisms that need to be established you know, uh, going forward. So it's a new world of dynamic, built-in, behavioral, logical uh, security. And that's what we're driving to with uh, VMware and our RSA uh, assets and why security mechanisms all the way into the underlying silicon become increasingly critical as we move forward uh, to the future. Because security in many ways will be the fundamental limiter of moving major applications and major services uh, into the cloud. So the next topic I wanted to touch on briefly is uh, big data. And uh, 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 the marketing manager for uh, EMC, uh, Jeremy Burton, he said that never has a term so vague meant so much to so many. Right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and that's a little bit of the big data, right? You know, it's sort of like cloud was three or four years ago, right? And today, when we talk about cloud, we have a very definitive view, right, of what exactly that means. But today, big data is still in this very embryonic uh, hype cycle, right, uh, type environment that it's often in. So let's try to bring a little bit more clarity to uh, big data and what it means, but also some of the thoughts on the opportunity. You know, the first thing when you say big data, it's big, right? right? You know, so what does that mean? Right? You know, in 2000, right, the digital corpus right, was uh, two exabytes. You know, today we do, two ex in 2011, two exabytes every day. And you know, being an old Moore's Law kind of guy, our digital corpus is growing at about 100% per year. Right? Moore's Law, you know, 100% every two years. 
right? So we're seeing that data growth, right, is the fastest thing occurring. And in fact, as we move to, you know, like the Internet of Things and we, keep, and we see machines talking to machines going forward, we'd expect, if anything, that the data sizes grow faster in the future. We move to social and video and media and higher resolution imaging and all of these right types of things is that the data growth is swamping right every other aspect of storage, network, and compute uh, growth rates as we uh, go forward. Right, and we're starting to see companies get very competent right um, in some of the early usages of big data, right, where they're starting to say, you know, marketing on the fly, right, where you know literally they're tracking every web click right, that's occurring, and modifying the web page that you're going to see next based on the behavioral and statistics, right, of what you've done so far, right? They're starting to, right, attack uh, different aspects of financial analysis with uh, big data, right, uh, uh, supply chain and operations. You know, at EMC, we had an uh, uh, excursion of one of our uh, hard disk drive suppliers uh, about uh, two years ago. It took us about uh, 10 months to see the statistical return data coming back to us that we then started to investigate more deeply. You know, it was 10 months worth, right, that, you know, then saw that, you know, in fact, we had, you know, a disk drive supplier had gone out of compliance. They had used some wrong, uh, you know, uh, oils in terms of their motor uh, that go into the disk drives, and we were starting to see failure rates, right, in certain hermetic conditions, right? And as a result, boom, you know, we had a crisis. We had to do drive recalls and replace, you know, field replacements and, you know, starting to seeing double drive failures a few triple drive failures, right? You know, just, you know, a terrible situation. Well, what we did is when we started to look then at the real data, right, what we realized was we could have detected this excursion approximately 10 months sooner had we been looking at the full synthesis of real-time analytic data that was occurring amongst all of our drives. But we didn't have the mechanisms to be gathering that data in real time against all of our customers and all of the drives that are in the field, right? Now, 10, you know, being able to find that problem 10 months earlier for us would have meant, you know, at least 200, probably, you know, $200 million of value, right, of being able to fix it sooner. And uh, when you add on top of that the customer pain, right, that we went through, right, it's probably two or three X that, right, associated with that. So what's EMC doing, right? By the middle of uh, 2013, we will be generating real-time data analytics on the running drives of every one of our storage, well, not everyone, we're probably about 70% by the middle of next year, right? So that we can do exactly this. You know, Mr. Weber, we have to take your disk off of, right, a service sometime in the next month because we would like to proactively replace a few drives for you, right? And that's the type of thing that big data is going to enable us and our supply chain to do Right, as we start applying it directly to how we run our business. But these are the types of things that we see right, that are emerging as we start looking at big data right, operations for the future. So what is big data? Right, you know, we think about it in a couple of ways. One is it's just that these data sets are so large they break the traditional view of IT infrastructures, where I might used to be trying to do a transactional data or a data warehouse on 10 terabytes, maybe 100 terabytes, but today, I would like to be able to look at petabytes of data in real time, right? And so it's the time dimension, it's the size dimension associated with it. It's also the type of data, where all of my former data warehousing activities would have been done on transactional or structured data. Now I increasingly want to look at semi-structured or unstructured data and be able to pull correlations or analysis against my structured data as well. So it's the type of data, structured, unstructured, and semi-structured data, right? It's the, right, the, the physical size of the data moving from terabytes to petabytes of data, right? It's moving from offline to real-time, right, analysis of those data and fundamentally breaking the types of IT systems that are available, right, today. And when we think about big data, that's what we think about. And of course, right, you know, being a storage CEO, you know, uh, president and COO for two, about two more days, we love big data. Right, you know, it just makes more and more things to store. Right, you know, that's just really good. We really like that, right, as well. But it's about bringing more analytics and insight into it, which brings me to the last piece of it is right. It's this real-time analytic insight. Over the last two decades, right, the fundamental application model has somehow centered around a database. 
And if you think about any application, sort of at the middle of it sat a database. Somewhere, somehow, was the center. And they were almost all built as some transactional, ACID-compliant, right, uh, transactional database model. In the big data world, you know, transactional databases are interesting, but they're no longer the center of activity, right? You've moved to the analytic databases, the analytic environments are where the action is uh, going forward. And those are increasingly built to scale out analytic infrastructures, increasingly aimed at real-time operations. And if you think about it in the broadest terms of the computing industry, you know, we believe that we're on the precipice of the third major data model right, that's emerged in the history of computing. The first one right, was ISAM data around financial data, and we saw basically the whole mainframe and early mini computer era. Right, that was the center of applications. We moved into the transactional database model for the last 20 years, and we think we're now going into analytics data right, as the center data model for the next 10 or 20 years. This is also giving rise to what we think of as the data scientists, right? And, uh, you know, for all of you geeks in the audience, your kids are wondering what the, should they grow up, right? And you're telling them to become a microprocessor engineer? Nah, probably not, right? Uh, but, right, we think this domain of data science becomes what computer science uh, has been over the uh, last uh, 20 or 30 years. 35 years ago, when most of us were fir first starting in school, computer science departments were just sort of rising up, right? They were sort of the weirdos that didn't quite fit into engineering and didn't quite fit into mathematics. We think over the next 10 or 20 or 30 years that data science emerges as one of the critical disciplines for the future. Right, and this combination of computer science, mathematics, and, and in particular statistical uh, methods, machine learning methods with uh, domain expertise becomes this critical new domain of data science. Right, and we see this rising up as one of the most interesting fields right, for the coming uh, couple of uh, decades is right, data scientists. Right, uh, EMC is putting a lot of emphasis on helping to create the data science uh, curriculum, working with uh, universities, working with our own training certification uh, processes to establish you know, what will become, just like computer science departments are today, right, the data science uh, curriculum uh, of uh, tomorrow. And you know, we think this is just an exciting new burgeoning area, right, again, you know, computer science, you know, engineering, mathematics, right, statistics, machine learning uh, space is emerging as one of the great disciplines for tomorrow. So, you know, in summary, right, you know, silicon is still incredibly uh, important, uh, you know, and we see, right, as this world moves to the edge, right, and the cloud is what connects the mother, uh, them together, right, all the action goes into the highly mobile social devices, right, on the one side, and uh, these cloud scale uh, data centers on the other side. Right, we see this fundamental transformation happening on what those data centers look like. You know, our language for that is what we call the software-defined data center. And we see this exciting uh, new domain emerging of really, really big uh, data sets and the analytics that will be done across those. And you know, we think of that as uh, big data. So thank you very much. And I think we now have some time for Qs and As that we can cover anything we feel like. Go ahead. Hi, Nathan Brookwood, Insight 64. Hey, Nathan, I haven't seen you for a while. How you <laughs> yeah. been? Pat, you still give great keynotes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nathan. <laughs> but I have... You didn't always say that about me, though. <laughs> <laughs> I've always said you give great keynotes. Thank you, Nathan. <laughs> In any event, uh, I was struck when you were talking about looking out at the carnage <laughs> on 128 or 495. You probably saw my old office as a deck and prime in there. Yeah, yeah, they're in that list. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then you talked about how in the future we have these mobile devices and the cloud. Obviously, Xeon plays a big role in the cloud. But what about all those Pentiums and Core I whatevers? Uh, that go into PCs today, notebooks, desktops, it seems like they're becoming less and res less relevant. What's your view on that? And isn't it true that as pl user pr platforms change, that's when, you know, things like digital equipment happen because the mini computer platform disappeared. So uh -huh. what's the future for Intel in terms of client space? 
Well, um, I'll say, you know, the future for Intel and client space. Let me talk about the future for client space. Right, okay. right. And I'll, uh, I'll try to refrain from being too Intel specific in that if I could, Nathan. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, you know, everybody talks about the post PC era. And let me define what I, if, when I use that terminology, what I mean first. Right. And, you know, we've moved into the era where, you know, I mean, we were in an era where, you know, essentially client applications were all designed for the PC as the center point, right, of the delivery of those applications. In the post-PC era, the PC is nothing but yet another delivery vehicle, and it's no longer the most significant one. So, right, for the most part, your applications are being developed for a cloud delivery model to multiple devices, and increasingly the center point of those devices is mobile social focused, right, where I carry a mobile device, right, I have an iPhone, an Android phone, a pad, and other devices for the future, and oh yeah, I need to run those apps on the PC as well, right, but, you know, it's increasingly just seen as another device, right, the locus of innovation right, you know, has moved away, right, from that point, and the center of it now is across all of these mobile delivered devices, with the cloud being the delivery model, right, for those services, and increasingly, right, delivered as a service, right, in those models as well. So, right, the role of the PC, hey, you know, you know, I had Michael stage, Michael Dell on stage next to me, right, on, uh, we did a CEO roundtable at uh, the VMworld on Monday. Right, you know, and he happened to say, you know, he, he gave, I didn't realize this, but he said that the post-PC era, right, that terminology was first brought forward in 1999 when the PC industry was less than 100 million devices, and today the PC industry is about 400 million devices. And so his phrase was, the post-PC era has been very, very good for the PC, right, you know, and, you know, it's... That, that, was a, that was a quote from Michael Dell. I didn't say it, so, someone like that. But, you know, clearly, you know, at the pinnacle of that industry is gone, right? It's now moved to these mobile devices, right? And that's where the center, right, will be. Clearly today, right, that's an ARM-centric world, right? You know, just dramatically so, right? You know, it's just, you know, 100 to 1 or something like that. And I don't see that changing, right, in that sense, right? You know, that's just where the center of that innovation is. That's what Apple is doing. You know, that's where most of the other, right, operating systems. Could it change? Possibly. I don't see it changing anytime soon, right, with you know, all deference to, you know, my x86 roots. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not going to be a lot of PCs. I mean, if I got work to do, right, I carry my, my PC. My, now I carry a Mac Air, right? That's religiously possible for a former Intel guy to do that, right? You know, I got an x86 inside of it. Um, but, uh, you know, that's not where the action is, right? You know, most people just carry their iPads now when they travel, right, anymore, right? It's only when they really got, you know, productivity work to do as opposed to, you know, light, right, work, reading, or delivery vehicles to do. And I don't see that changing, Nathan, right, going forward. And at the same time, I see the data center as an all x86 world, right? You know, and we could debate, you know, I don't see ARM servers emerging there, right? <laughs> Just to answer your next question, I don't see it. That, that was my next question, but I'm going to stop because there's a line behind me. Very Thanks. good. Yes, but that is my question. <laughs> so, uh, Shubha Mukherjee Kavyum. So Shubu, uh, right, are you an ARM server guy? Yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, the analysts are predicting that about a quarter of the market, server market, who knows if it's right or wrong, you're predicting, analysts are predicting, everyone's predicting. But analysts are predicting about a quarter of the server market will be ARM, will be ARM servers in about three to five years. Uh, yeah. So given that, isn't it dangerous for EMC or VMware to just bank on x86? Um, so let me, you know, first thing, I don't believe those numbers, right, you know, and, you know, let me tell you why, right, is that okay? I'll give you my answer to it, is that if you take the core, the power of the core to zero, right, the power requirements delivered to do a server workload, right, when you comprehend I.O., memory, et cetera, is, right, not changed all that much. Right, and the individual x86 core, right, power now, you know, you go take a low, you know, uh, a low power core, right, you're only talking two or three watts in the core, right, you know, and at the lowest end, it's close to a watt. Take it to zero, it doesn't matter because you still got memory power, I.O. power, et cetera, associated with that. So fundamentally, I don't think the math makes sense, right, when you go look at it. And the cost of heterogeneity, right, for this large pool, 
right, of infrastructure. Remember, you know, if you go back, you know, I want to abstract and I want to pool this infrastructure, I got to get a huge value, right, for a heterogeneous pool inside of that, right? And if I don't get a huge value, right, for a discontinuous architecture, that means I can't schedule across the whole pool, right? I can't pick up workloads from here and move them there. I can't power them down, right? I can't HA or DR or fail them over to other data centers, right? The cost of heterogeneity in a cloud computing model to me is very high. So I don't think the math works, right, on the power performance characteristics, and I don't think the architecture works in terms of this cloud-scale computing. Now, that said, hey, if they emerge, they're really good. You know, we'll, of course, make our software support them as well, right? But, you know, I'm skeptical, right? So these 25% kind of things, right? You know, so I'm very biased to x86 on this side, and I think ARM is it on the other side. Thank you. <laughs> I may be wrong, but I'm not in doubt. Uh, John Davis, Microsoft Research. Uh, one Hi, of the John. things that you're not covering in this is anything on hardware specialization and what that role might be in the data center. Can you comment on how VMware is going to play with that, if at all? Do you mean, just define what you mean by hardware specialization. So I'm going even further and looking at specialized units within the processor. So you can see that in, say, you know, iBridge, yeah. GPUs now, but me making it even more extreme in terms of functional units, those types yeah. of things. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, frankly, um, you know, any form of specialized hardware, right, you know, to me it always is, it has to give a big gain to be worthwhile. Sure. Right? And I've always sort of had my decade, right, as sort of in my rule of thumb. If it's not a 10x gain, don't bother me. Right, because, you know, two or three years, right, you know, you know, your basic, you know, improvements in Moore's Law and x86 swamps it, so the value of heterogeneity disappears. So, right, if you're not at least a decade, right, you know, an order of magnitude improvement, don't worry about it. But within that, right, hey, you know, if there's good accelerators, right, that can fit into a model, as I described, the shared pool of infrastructure that has a software emulation layer that says, if it's there, take advantage of it, and if it's not, this is how to, you know, this is how the software can perform or the scheduling of workload can perform, and that can be done in a software coherent way with standard interfaces. You know, we're very comfortable with that. You know, we do support a, you know, VMware supports a, a GPU offload mechanism today. We just opened up a flash offload mechanism, right, right with the uh, latest release of vSphere 5.1, uh, so starting to take advantage of special purpose memory right, types as well. So we'll, we'll keep doing those types of things for the future, but it won't fundamentally alter this view of this homogeneous layer crossing the whole uh, data center. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hi, John Massey from TechVisor. Um, so a, a couple quick observations, and then that leads to a, a question for you. The, the amusing observations is how things keep coming back that used to be. Um, <laughs> yeah. b b back at Bell Labs in the 70s, I don't know how many hundreds of slides I saw from people with a cloud in the middle. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and, and then I've just, because I've been bugged by reporters the last week or so, looking for the origin of the term big data. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Turns out I used it in a couple hundred talks in the late 90s, right? And the, the issue in the talks particularly was worrying about bandwidths and latencies, right? And uh, one thing you sort of didn't go into much is, you know, what you need from the network infrastructure and the, the bandwidths to deal with all the big data, since we know that does not scale, uh, you know, with the uh, actual storage size. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so what do you um, need from that? What are you, yeah, what are you hoping yeah. for? Because that's, that's what a lot of people here do also. Yeah. And, and just, you know, may, maybe I should be referencing you when I use the term big data. Well, I don't claim to invent it. I just used it an awful lot. <laughs> if you, but if you find any prior art, give me their name. I'll reference them. So, right, you know, happy. You know, we, we also use the term big and fast data now. Right, because we see both yeah. aspects of that, that on the one end of the spectrum, you just want larger and larger data sets. On the other end of the spectrum, you want faster and oh, yeah. faster data, right, you, you know, for, you know, in-memory types of things as well. And we see that dynamic range increasing uh, going uh, forward. But, uh, you know, coming back to the specifics of the question of the network characteristics uh, between them, in some respects, you know, uh, our thoughts on big data are actually to avoid unique requirements on the network in the sense that a well-designed scale-out implementation, right, in fact, can live on, uh, you know, let, let's call it the standard network topology of the day, right? Because if I'm demanding a lot of additional things from the network, 
right, then I'm creating a more heterogeneous environment versus being able to say, hey, 10 gig is good enough or 40 gig is good enough, et cetera. So in many respects, we think of the problem as making sure I've done the scale out architecture very well, right, so that I don't uniquely demand very exotic, right, you know, technologies, bandwidth, et cetera, between it. Now, that said, right, you know, between, you know, we continue to say, give us more, give us more, give us more, right, because in that sense, right, you know, either the domains that I'm able to do, right, the scale out sizes that I'm able to do, the coherence domains, you know, or maybe the isolation of fault domains, all of those things are largely, right, inversely proportional to the size of that network uh, performance, right, or proportional to the size of that network performance. So keep giving us more. We also see that we do want, right, particularly in the control plane of those networks, software programmability, right? And to us, that becomes far more important these days than in many of the protocol or physical characteristics of the network is to bring that software programmability because any well-designed data center today, right, you find that actually you're utilizing, you know, a fraction of the available bandwidth, right, because you can't set up the routing tables properly, you don't have the switching, right, you know, the, you know all of those types of things lead you to un dramatically underutilize the physical networking resources that are available today. You know, that's why we just spend $1.26 billion buying NYSERA, right, we're doing a lot of things to bring that software programmability, that virtual plane, right, to the uh, networking space. Now, that brings a lot of requirements on what the underlying network interfaces and the APIs and open flow and open type characteristics that it offers. Yeah. I, I just raised it because a lot of people just get excited about how much disk space there is without <laughs> worrying about how you get it. Yeah, yeah. I've had Madan. Oh, Ruby sorry. Lee, Princeton yes, Ruby. University. Hi. So I wanted to address the first part of your talk, which is the cloud transforms IT. And we know the cloud is very useful in consolidation, uh, conservation of overall energy, high time to set, a uh, short time to set up your infrastructure and all this. But I think I'm quoting a statement of yours you, you just said, security will be the fundamental limiter of moving applications to the cloud. And I wonder, is this just the provider's feeling, or have customers actually uh, said this? And is there, um, are there enough non-security applications for the cloud still to grow? Or has, have we really reached a point where if we don't bring in secure applications, the cloud will not grow? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, citing, you know, uh, a few market studies, you know, basically the, uh, you know, the cloud is unquestionably growing, right, public cloud, right, we're also seeing what we'll call private, private. clouds, yeah. right, the internal data centers being architected and operated like a public cloud would be just for my own private data center purposes. So if we talk about the public cloud proper, um, you know, clearly that's growing. And that, by the way, is growing faster than private data center resources is, you know, probably about twice as fast overall. So clearly these security concerns, which I'll get to in a second, right, are not fundamentally saying preventing the cloud from growing because it's clearly growing, right? And they're being driven by ease of access, right, simple rate cards, right, you know, you know uh, models of IT growth, right, where I can do things and be able to scale without, right, economic or, right, time, uh, uh, limitations, right, to that growth. So clearly that has benefit. But when we talk to CIOs, right, as well as many studies have now been done, if you go to many of, I'll say, the main applications of enterprises, right, no way are they moving to the cloud. And the number one limitation to that is security. Right, and I think there's been IDC studies, Gartner studies, McKinsey studies, et cetera, that have reaffirmed that point, that that, that's, that ranks number one by far, right, on their limitations. And in fact, in many cases, they will not even move to private cloud architectures for security limitations, right, as well, right? And they don't yet have necessarily the PCI compliance in place, or they don't have the audits in place, et cetera, that will allow them to say that, hey, my private cloud is even secure in that uh, respect. So, you know, we think this is a big problem, and for a technology company or a technology industry, problem is opportunity, right? So that's why we're diving very aggressively uh, into that space of what needs to be done, right, to solve those limitations of security in the cloud, 
What about the mom and pop stores? Yeah, and uh, you know, in that sense, you know, mom and pop, right? And, and you know, it's hard to talk about mom and pop because mom and pop on a global basis has very different characteristics across the globe, right? But you know, the you know the the, the highest form of security when you go to SMB, right, is being able to lock up your hard drives at night. That's what they do, right? They take them out, right, of their you know local sand device, you know, their local sand storage device, and they put them into their safe or they carry them home. That's their idea of security at night, right? Nice physical air gap security, right? Number one solution for small businesses on a global basis. Isn't that great, right? You know, all right, you know, we've made a lot of progress as an industry, right? So, in that sense, you know, clearly this is a huge concern on a global basis. Now, that said, cloud continues to grow. Why? It's easy to use, right? Easy to build, right? Fits, right? You don't have to carry capital costs to do it. There's lots of value associated with it. So, our opportunity is fix those problems so it can continue to grow. We should all not sleep too well with the federal government wanting to move completely to cloud very well, shortly. Well, but, uh, and by the, reason, by the way, that's one of the reasons that, you know, we're strong believers in this idea of hybrid cloud. Some things belong in the public cloud, some things belong in the private cloud. You know, one of the things that happens is, right, and we, you know, we've had many companies describe this to us, they fear that if they would move their data to the public cloud, and let's say Amazon now gets subpoenaed by the government, Right, they've lost control of their data. At least when it's in their private cloud, you know, the government has to subpoena them, right, not the cloud provider. Right? And that says, boy, you know, we're only going to keep you know, certain things running on our infrastructure as a direct result right, of some of those concerns. So uh, uh, one more question, and then let's... Uh... Yeah. Hi, Ben. Medan from Intel. Um, great talk. Reminded me of IDF a few years back. Um, anyways, uh, you, you covered um, compute, you covered um, storage, but I, and you showed a nice model transitioning from today's um, client to a future model. And you didn't touch upon communication um, and uh, communication bandwidth in particular. The communication infrastructure, as you know, in the 90s, the build out stopped. And it has not made much progress since then. So do you see your model being modulated by uh, communication limitations, let's say Netflix traffic or YouTube traffic and everything else competing with the overall business traffic? Um, the, uh, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you know, fundamentally, no. We don't see that as a limitation, right? You know, particularly when you go look at, uh, you know, if you look at terrestrial bandwidths, right, without looking at wireless or other things like that, you know, they continue to, you know, double approximately every three to four years. Right, computing doubling every two years or so, right? You know, the biggest limitation is uh, wireless or right any form of spectrum, right? At that, and God only gave us so much, so it you know increases at the slowest rate, right? You know, I can't, you know, I can put more fiber in the ground, I can't put more spectrum in the air, right? In that sense, so that does become right a fundamental limiter. Now, you know, we're we're maybe a little bit, uh, uh, you know, Pollyanna or a little bit uh, removed from that in the sense that, you know, my business isn't fundamentally in those areas. You know, we're an infrastructure data center focused, right, and I, I'm not, you know, delivering phones or consumer devices that are more, right, to, driven by those issues. Now, that said, you know, we do see lots of things that we do enabling more efficient use of spectrum, right, and we are doing things like, uh, you know, working with some of the telecoms, right, and being able to put a virtual caching system into their base stations, so they're able to cache data all the way to the individual base stations or wire tower, right? And they're able to, you know, double, triple, quadruple the efficiency, right, of their networks when they do that, because often they're actually more limited by backhaul than they are by, you know, downstream uh, bandwidths to those kind of things. So we see that there's all sorts of things that we can do to help them build a more virtualized, cloud-friendly infrastructure in the process. But, you know, we're a little bit removed from some of the direct, you know, I'll say wireless spectrum issues with our, our business, and I'm certainly not the expert, and I think you had a speaker already here who's, you know, much closer to that than I am, per se. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Pat, uh, thank you very much, and a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you.